The scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17 to verse number 24. Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17 to verse number 24. And I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. The scripture reads, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I have read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to verse number 24. Let us be led in prayer. In the valley, shining bright as a morning star.
name, even though we got the same name, who what name they gonna think it for us? They gonna think it's my name, and then on top of that, because he is a representative of me. See, he a preacher. You know, not already. You know they say preachers' kids are the worst kids. Y'all see what I'm saying? So we gotta be mindful that we will tell our children. You know better, you ought to do better. We will tell them when they're playing sports. You knew that guy was doing this, and you could have did that, you could have did that. But when it comes to the word of God, do as I say, but not as I do. We'll tell our children, you do what you know you learn. What we learn, we know, but a whole bunch of us come to church, and we don't do better. So the text, verses 17 through 19 of Ephesians 4th chapter, Paul is writing to the churches. Remember, there's more than one church. He's writing to house churches. They didn't have one building. Everybody came together. But house churches to uh, concerning their new relationship now that they are in Christ in reference to the world, the relationship they used to have with the, with the world. Verse number 17 of chapter 4. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. He's now saying that now that you are Christian, you have to stop living like the world does. Okay. You need to stop. If I can't tell the difference between the world and you, but you show up at church on Sunday, then there's a problem somewhere. Okay. So it's not that you can dress different because everybody can dress a certain way and look like you're going to church. <laughs> but you might be on your way to that because you know they, they used to be nighttime establishment. You go to certain places, it's all during the day. I don't know if y'all know that, but... Um, He's saying you need to stop. He was actually in the Greek saying, stop an action that I know you're already doing. Paul knew, as many of us know today, that there's some baptized Christians who are still speaking, who's still living, whose behavior is no different than how they used to live or behaved before they were baptized into Christ. So we get to the end of verse number 17, or well, verse number 19 of chapters, but verses 17 through 19. Paul lists a series of characteristics of the heathen or the worldly behavior, or the worldly lifestyle, to which he's inferring that the Gentiles, at that point, seeing that they're ignorant and blind to the truth, technically they have an excuse. But in verses 20 through 21, he tells them, You can't use that excuse because I know you know better. Just like when we deal with our children, think about it now. When our children be with other children and they do something wrong in school, well, so and so and so and so was doing it. What do we tell them? But I taught you better. Mm -hmm. You know better than to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they were doing, because you know the, the thing we always tell about it. If Johnny jump off the bridge, you're going to jump off too? Nowadays, you better not ask that question, because then Johnny might jump too. Believe that long. But understand that the same principle that we put on our children. And what we put on everybody else, we should expect that from our own selves. Because you'll show up with the preacher up and say, preacher, oh, he knew better. Well, the same thing I'm supposed to know, you're supposed to know too. Moving right along. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, just as truth in Jesus. So in other words, Paul was letting them know that he knows that they heard the truth. They were taught the truth. They learned the truth. They understood the truth because he personally taught them the truth. But also from Acts 18, 19, 21, we find out it was not only him, but Priscilla and Aquila. And then he, he left. He was there for a short period of time. Then he came back uh, in Acts 19. He stayed there three years. So in other words, he's saying, I taught y'all for a brief time, and then I taught y'all for three years. You have no excuse. Matter of fact, the beauty of that is, think about it. If somebody done taught you something in your job for a couple of years, and you mess up, and they fire you, you feel like, I've been discriminated against. Well, no. After three years, there's some things you ought to know better. Mm -hmm. Ask them to go get the chicken joint. They've been doing this for so long, and they mess up. Why you go? Because there's some things you ought to know better. Mm -hmm. So, he's implying that not only have they learned and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they've been Christians long enough to have stopped acting like they used to do, doing the same things they used to do, and by now you ought to mature in Christ. Right. What's his point? Amen. That's a folk that's been in the church too long to yes. be still acting yes. 
yes. the way they do. Yes. And some of us, we can, we can look back and sometimes say, now, how long have you been in the church? Yes. How long have you been a Christian and you still, no one will ever know that you're a Christian because of the behavior that you still yes. do. Mm -hmm. I've been in the church, though. All my life. You know, folks say, I was born in the church. Mm -hmm. Now you're born by the river next to a church. <laughs> but, but it's the same. We need to be mindful that people are watching you. Yes. We, we made the joke, um, um, everywhere I go, somebody sees me. Mm -hmm. I'm in public just trying to get some free medicine. Somebody sinked me. Now, I'm sorry, they didn't really sink me, but they sinked the vehicle. Yeah, that's the improper grammar. S E E N T. But they saw me, and then the next thing they saw Wednesday was, where's you at uh, Publix? Well, no, I, I can't go nowhere. So what does that mean? It doesn't make a difference where you think you go. Somebody will see you. Go to Florida. You are riding you off in the, um, uh, what's that thing when you do a lot of walking, you spend money, you shouldn't spend it, but a whole bunch of stores? That's the next thing. I'm minding my own business by myself. And somebody saw me. How do you see me? Out of all, I know I wasn't the only person that complexion, but they seen to me. Because I get a text, was that you? I just saw you. Don't ask me, was that you? When you just said, I just saw you. I just came down there to get my walk on. Y'all know I ain't spending no money. But anyway, I go down and get the rest of my seat. But what I'm saying is, people are always watching you. So when you think you can get away from something, somebody will see you. Your behavior has caused many of people to not want to come to church. Let me keep moving. I'm explaining to you why. Right now, the Bible, is, the Bible teaches us, or the gospel teaches us, that we should grow in the gospel. The same gospel that you obeyed is the same gospel that you're supposed to keep obeying. Well, I got in, I'm good now. Now you don't want to obey. The same gospel that saved you is the same gospel that's supposed to keep you saved. But in order to keep you saved, you need to go back to the first one, which is to continue to obey the gospel. The same gospel that made you a newborn babe in Christ. You know, it's all oh, you just a newborn. You just a newborn. 20 years later, you're still a newborn. Something wrong with that picture. We are supposed to mature and grow in Christ. And the reason why I say that is, I personally won't accept people not growing because I know where I used to be. Say something slick to me. Not only would I get slick back with you in the church, be loud enough to embarrass you, that way other folk will know if you want to try and make me prepared for the consequences of your actions. It didn't, I didn't go that way way overnight. But I can say now, 20 years later, I'm a whole different person. Now, I still go slick when slick come, because I'm too hands all. But it's how I respond to folk, or rather, yeah. not respond to foolishness, exactly. that allows people to see who you really are. Because yes. yes. I always say, if you see two people in the back, over there cussing, going on, you see a man, you're like, those some fools arguing. And you see one person standing there, and another person going up, look at that person going on over there, and he just standing there taking but look at the smile on his face because he's thinking, yeah, <laughs> you almost got me, Satan. That's why you have to understand you grow into where you used to have a coming to Jesus meeting when you forgot to bring Jesus versus when you grow, you have a coming to Jesus meeting and Jesus standing right there. It changes the way you used to do Because when you forgot Jesus at the coming to Jesus meeting, you let everybody know you were no part of Jesus. But now when I deal with folk, I'm like, I know Jesus is he's right there. Yes. How would you respond if you knew Jesus was standing right there, especially since you don't realize he actually is standing right there with you? Would you say the things that you say? Would you do the things that you do? We got to start growing up. Anything that's not growing, that means something's wrong. Y'all see what I'm saying? So we got to be mindful that the same gospel that got you in is the same gospel that's supposed to save you, but it's the same gospel that's supposed to get you in heaven. So a lot of folk go miss heaven because they are not obeying oh, yeah. the gospel. Mm -hmm. Which is why Paul says in chapter 4, verse number 1 through 3, which was pretty much the basis of last week's lesson, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or urge you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. With all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing in one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. 
which means there has to be a continuous renewing of the spirit of the mind before there will ever be a change in your behavior. What do I mean is, if you don't start saying, I'm going to start changing this way, your body and your mind, your, I'm sorry, your rest of your body is never going to change. LaPont's made a statement that made sense. When he said about going boat, when I used to go fishing, I took two things, well, three things. You took your fishing stuff. That's one, the fishing stuff. But I always took me, well, that's why I was just so I let you know y'all didn't do this. I kept a, I didn't keep uh, six packs. That was a waste of time. You put bottles with ice there, and I kept me a pack of Marlboro cigarettes. That was what you did in fishing. And when he said he just sits in the burn, I was thinking, man, we could have went to the same school. He just didn't say he drank. But my point is this. There are some things that we used to do that you now change. He said he would have never stopped smoking or even put up shit until he changed his mind that I'm going to stop. Now, regardless of the reason why I stopped, it's because I didn't want to lose a bet. But the point is, until I say I'm not going to do something, guess what you're going to do? You're going to continue doing it. Because that's why, be careful this new year. It's a new year, a new me. Stop taking that lie. It's the same you, just a new year. The question is, are you going to change? Which means you're going to start from here first, and then you go. So the point that I'm trying to get you to see is what you believe is what affects your behavior. What you believe in is actually going to affect your behavior. It doesn't make a difference. This is what a religious quote. How much you know about Christ. It doesn't make a difference how much scripture you can quote. It doesn't make a difference whether or not you read the Bible from front to the back three, four, five, six times. Let me get the old Baptist with you. It doesn't make a difference how big your Bible is or how long you've been a Christian. If you don't believe in what you know about Christ, you will never believe in Christ. I know that through some people off. A lot of people know about Christ, but the question is, their behavior, not the question, their behavior lets you know whether or not they believe in Christ. If you believe in Christ, then there's gonna be a change in your behavior. Y'all see what I'm saying? There's a lot of folks come to church and there's no change in their behavior. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. But your actions say, I appreciate the Lord. I thank him. Matter of fact, what's that song? Uh, and I'm going to take it out of context. I keep falling in love with him over and over again, over and over again. My question is, when did you fall out of love with the Lord? When he stopped doing what you wanted? Y'all see what I'm saying? So be mindful that you have to understand that what you believe is going to affect the way you behave. If you don't believe in Auburn, you would be fooling with them uh, road tie folks. That's right. Y'all see what I'm saying? Now that makes sense to you? What you believe in is going to affect your behavior. How you believe is going to affect on what you dress, how you speak. If I ever hear the past really talking about some man, uh, two and two and all the other people on that team, and all he talked about, matter of fact, can I talk this off over here? Have y'all realized that this has nothing to do with the lesson, but since I'm talking about two or two, I don't even know his name. Have y'all noticed how much folk talk about Alabama and Auburn and the game and how that fella did all this good stuff and how uh, the first, uh, what's that stuff he did? All that stuff that's going on. Come to church with it. You have to, it's time to charge church now. You, it's time for the Lord to begin this morning worship. And you, all you still hear is Alabama this and Auburn that. And you ain't heard one time about how good the Lord is. Y'all see what I'm saying? Yes. What you believe in affects your behavior. Not saying you can't believe in your Alabama and Auburn team. But honestly, I guarantee you there's been many a son in the church that all folk talked about just in Alabama. It's Alabama and Auburn. You got to fight folk to shut up and start bringing the Lord's worship stuff. I'm just saying, if, you, if your guilty conscience feels like he's saying something about me, then apparently the rock's in you. <laughs> but I just want you to know my whole timeline for a week, that's all we talked about was what happened. Yes. Yes. And I'm thinking, you're the same Christians and I ain't saying nothing about the Lord, but you'll talk about Monday through Saturday, uh -huh. old time. Yes. 
Then on Sunday, if you love the Lord, it's prayer time is. Y'all see what I'm saying? You get roll tide six days in the Lord one. Move right along. So what I'm saying is, if you don't believe in Christ, you'll never walk worthy of the vocation which you're called. That makes sense. That's all I'm saying. So be mindful that if all I know about you is war eagle and roll tight, that's what you talk about at work, you talk about at church, you talk about at home, you talk about every other place. Then on Sunday, you can put in all the posts about how the Lord is good. Who's getting the most glory? Okay, just want to make sure. That's all I'm saying. I'm not talking about how well you wear your clothes. Not whether or not you roll tight one day. I'm talking about your behavior, how you speak, what you say. What you love the most is what you're going to talk about the most. Move right along. So, I didn't get the chance to explain what walking worthy is last time because I got, y'all saying so many amens, I got caught up and completely forgot. So, I've slowed down to say this. To walk worthy or to live worthy of the vocation which you call, the vocation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means to constantly value. The word worthy is a, another word for the root word worth. So which means I need to value God's gift of grace and mercy. I need to value God's gift of redemption, uh, salvation, and the inheritance in heaven that we have through the sacrifice of Jesus' Son. Now here's the thing. When someone doesn't value something, their actions say that they don't value it. I know how to explain this. We talk about children. Mess around and get your child a car. Go with me for a minute. Now remember you gave them the car as a gift. They're going to love the car up front. Y'all know that, right? Oh, mom and daddy got me a car. They're going to keep it clean on the inside and out. It'll be raining and they'll use the rain of the Lord to keep it clean. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I used to do the same thing. That's why I know. They'll get the oil change every 3,000 or every 3,000. How many miles is it? Yeah, 3,000 miles every three months. They will, this is how you know they really love the car, because they'll keep the gas light thing at half full. Then always you get in the car, the car smells good. When they go to Walmart, they don't park up front where they park. At the far end, so nobody will hit it. They, they, they park it so nobody will scratch your dent. But after a while, You'll notice that the gas light comes on two or three times a week. That same car will look, smell, and sound like it belongs in the junkyard. What does that mean? They no longer value it. They don't value the gift that was given to them. But here's the flip side. When they buy their own car, not something they got. Somebody say, look out, that means you know what I'm talking about. Three years later, after buying their own car, the car still now stays at half full. You get to it, the car still clean. Three years later, you get in there, it still smells good. They continue to still get that oil change every three months, whether they need it or not. Somebody y'all know what I'm talking about. But what are they doing by three years later? Doing what they wasn't doing three years later when they got it free. They're showing you that they value exactly. what they have. Amen. So what's my point? We show love to who and what we value the most. What do I mean by that? When every time I see you, roll tag. Not that you can't say roll tag. But when you come to the Lord's house, guess what I don't really particularly want to hear? Roll tag. Hold on, I don't want to be mad. Whoa, eagle. You don't hear me talking about go balls, we can't win nothing. No way, so I ain't going to say it. But the point is, be mindful that that's all, if that's all I hear from you, guess what you're telling me? I'm not, yes, I am judging you. I am judging you according to your behavior. So my thing is, when you're not here, if you're going to bring it into churches, we got to shut it down. To leave, can you leave uh, yesterday's game so we can talk about the Lord today? Amen. We talked about what's the Lord on Tuesday. What's his name? The guy on the What's his name? You got what you saying? Jalen Hurst. Jalen Hurst. Last year, they, they got rid of him because he wasn't doing the thing. I 
I'm saying the reason why he could have defective is because they knew who he was, they set it up, they knew exactly what they were getting, so they shut it down. Wasn't that he was another defective? They just knew what they were getting, so they designed their defense that way. Now we go to this new one. The other fella hurt his ankle. He comes in. Guess what Jalen is now? He's a savior. So now, knowing that that's the savior, all I'm hearing is everybody has to save. But as a Christian, I don't know who is really the savior. Y'all see what I'm saying? Yes. And I keep coming back to this because we're talking about what you believe in the most is how what affects your behavior, which means what you say and what you do. I'm not trying to, because you will catch me at the right moment. I have my Tennessee jersey on in a minute. When we played out of Alabama with my jersey on, I knew we were going to lose. I was just hoping that they didn't score 52 points on us. But I'm going to still stick with who I believe in. So all I'm saying is, when you value something, your behavior will let everyone know what you value and what you love and what you don't love. Amen. Your actions and behavior will let everybody know that either you value something or you don't value something. So when you see someone who has been given the gift of salvation by God, yes. and they refuse to walk yes. worthy yes. of the vocation which they were called, yes. what is their behavior actually telling them? Or a matter of fact, what is their behavior telling God? And what is it really telling us? That they do not love, nor do they value the gift of God's grace and mercy or the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for their sins. Yes. Yes. That's what it's saying. Yes. So when I understood that, that's another reason why I can say I changed. Do I really want to cuss some folk out? Absolutely. I, I can think of the words in succession of how I want to say it. But because I valued what I was given, yes. because he said, even though when you was in sin and kept on sinning, I died for you anyway. Yes. Yes. So now that I've died for you and you know I've died for you, then the least you could do is act like yes. you know hey, that. Man. That makes sense? So... If I can do it, and the thing is, that's why I can tell somebody. Somebody told me one day, I just can't see you doing that. I just can't. I just can't see you doing it. Thank God that you can't imagine the type of person I was. Because guess what that tells me? I have changed. You see this? Mm -hmm. No, I've been changed. Mm -hmm. yes. Angels in heaven, sign my name? No. By them telling me they can't see me being that way, that tells me that, that there is a change. But if you do value the gift of salvation, then you're going to walk worthy of the vocation which you're called. And I always say that because I said this. I wouldn't be the minister here if I didn't walk worthy of the vocation which I'm called. Y'all supposed to clap. That's, that's a, that is a, a compliment on y'all. Saying that there's no way y'all would have allowed me to be your preacher if I was out there doing this, that, and some other stuff. That's right. Oh, would you? Would y'all let me be? Would right. Somebody should shook their head. No, okay, all right. If not, we might have another class on something. That's right. So that being said, Paul then gives us a small list of attributes that Jesus has that we must have in chapter verses number two and three. Lowliness means humility. Just simply means, yes, I can, it's the opposite of arrogance and pride. I don't have to show that I went to school to show you up when you say something that might be incorrect. That, that makes sense. In other words, I don't have to act like I'm smarter than you, or I'm better than you, because I went to school. The best thing about me going to school is, is that I learned some things I didn't learn. I learned how to study a certain way. But the best thing about what I don't have that you don't have is them school loans that I'm going to pay to the day I got. So understand, my credit is getting better, but you're going to pay them school loans or they're going to take it. That makes sense? Also, then he says meekness, which is another word for gentleness. The word meekness means it's, it's used in, what is that, Jesus and Moses. It's saying it's like a wild animal. A horse is one of the strongest animals out there. But the meekness means the horse is a wild animal, but he's tamed to serve. That means that's a book of bears that's been out there. And when the Lord got hold to them, they keep saying, I can't believe that that's you. Because you are now meek. Yes, you got the power to embarrass them, blow them up, make them look like they're this big. But you tame that because you're serving. Ooh, that's the best part. Yeah. Then he says long suffering, which is just patience. Um, we have to be long suffering with other people because God has been long suffering with you. Amen. Some of us, the Lord should have took you out a long time ago with the stuff you yes. did. Yes. 
Yes. But he was long suffering to say, you know what? I have a plan. Yes. And you don't even realize the plan yes. doesn't include you dying yet. I got a plan because I need you for another reason. When you know good and well you should be in jail or dead yes. or caught up. Yes. But for whatever reason, you survived whatever it was because God was long suffering. And then he uses bearing with one another. That simply means showing tolerance for one another. We should continue to deal with our faults and our weakness for our brothers and sisters. Meaning, everybody here is from a different background. There's some folk here that their background comes out. And they'll say things to me that I don't think they all say. But me being bare with one another, I just laugh and say, I'm going to chalk that up to you. That's the way you was raised. But you ain't going to keep talking to me like I'm two years old. We got people here that don't realize that we grown and they will talk to you like they're one of your children. And then get mad and say, hold on, I ain't one of your children. What you mean? Exactly what I mean. So what I'm saying is you have to bear with people's different personalities. Yes, yes, there ain't yes, and one of yes, us the same in here. Yes. God, I'm going to mess with somebody. Like if you didn't grow up with Tony, yes. it takes some serious uh, bearing with one another. I can mess with Tony like that. Because it doesn't make a difference. Now, I can't say that about Jimmy, but I do know about Jimmy. Jimmy's good. But me and Tony, I watched Tony when he was younger. That's some days Tony used to show out and think of beat him. <laughs> a different Tony now. But we all still have, we have to worry about Because Sister Janice, I love her to death, but she's so mad. Somebody should say that, man. No, Tony didn't. Boy, you get in trouble with that. No, I okay, which means <laughs> Paul is saying when you have all these things, you make an effort. To do it. But how do you do this? He says you do all of this in love. That's the key ingredient. Ingredient. Ingredient is love. You do what you do in love. Not because you got to, but when you love somebody, because you tolerate people in your family who you know is wrong is too left. Because you love them. They will do some stuff that you know you're like, what is wrong with you, boy? I love you, brother, but you never do that again. I take it. Okay, but I mean, you love them and you're tolerant with some folk. Yeah. So we understand, he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He said, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, we all have some differences. Matter of fact, this is the thing about knowing that you have to deal with others' um, um, differences. In Romans, 12th chapter, verse number 18. Romans 12th chapter, verse number 18. Paul was talking to the Romans, and he knew what type of atmosphere that they were in. He said, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everybody. He said, this is up to you to whether or not you're going to make peace or you're going to have to bring the peace. You Sometimes it's best to say nothing in order to keep the peace in the church house. Which means, here's the thing, some of us have got to stop being so mean. I'm just going to say it. There's too many in the church that's so mean. And what's the thing is, we really get mean when we're trying to be right. Even if you are right, you're mean-spirited when you do it. There's a wrong way and a right way to talk to folk. There's some people back in the day from the old church I used to go to found out the hard way. The wrong way to talk to me is the wrong way to talk to me. I cuss some folks out. My brother, brother Jackson, hard, hard Jackson, he got a cuss now that I had to ask him, God and the church building and everybody else to forgive me because he talked to me in a way and I'm thinking, I didn't care if I was doing the church. You ain't going to talk to me that way. Guess what he never did? Anymore. And he talked to other folk that way. But the thing is, I look back and think, wow, that's the person I should respect as my elder. But what I'm saying is, there's a wrong way and a right way to talk to folk. There's a worldly way, that's a Christian way to talk to folk. There's a godly way and an ungodly way to talk to everybody. So when we get to Ephesians 4, chapter verse number 15, that's what Paul was alluding to when he says, Speaking the truth in love. That we may grow up 
in all things. He said that you may grow up. Stop being the way you used to and grow up. That's what I'm trying to say. You claim you're a Christian, but you're still sipping on milk. If somebody give you some meat, my stomach hurt. I can't digest that or you choke on it and you spit it out. It's time to stop sipping on milk. And start chewing on the word of God, digesting that word, and then what happens is, as old as us is, I'm, now you got me saying us is. You might as well say, as old as us is, if we all just stop eating meat, stop eating vegetables, and drink milk, what would happen to us? We start deteriorating. Because that's not enough to fill us. In order for us to grow, we're going to need some stronger food. If you understand the meanness that you have, and the way that you have spoken for, don't you realize how many Christians will and have stopped coming to church because of the way you talk to them? Have you ever thought about that? If it's not you, not, not them, but let's say you want those people to stop coming. And then you would ask yourself, why'd you stop coming? Was it because of something the preacher said in the word? No, because somehow somebody said something to you or how somebody treated you. This is what Paul is trying to say. You got to stop being mean. That's the, oh, that's the nicest way I can say it. Because think about this. Not only how many Christians stop coming to church, but how many non-Christians won't come to church because they see how you talk to folk at your job. They have seen you show your own behind in the church. And they were like, you want to come to church? We're trying to invite folk. No. That's right. Because here's what happened. You told their grandma when they were going to hell. But you don't have a heaven to hell to put somebody in. So we need to be mindful of how we talk to yes. folk. Yes. I have to be that way because that's what I had to do for me. Yes. I didn't realize, I, I knew I was low down, but I didn't know how low down I was. But that's why you got that good friend. I was like, no, but you can't talk like that. How come I can't? When he got through with me, I felt so bad, I had to go back to cloud and tell Brother, brother uh, oh, he said the first in class, uh, Brother Baker, I was sorry. I thought I was in the right, but the way I talk to him, you can exactly. be right. Yeah, exactly. But it's how you say what yes. you say. Yes. So it ain't about being right, it's about being righteous. Mm -hmm. So I understand we have to grow up from saying things, because here's the thing, you're going to mess around and say something to the wrong person. That's not a Christian. Mm -hmm. And when they cuss you out, Call you everything but a child of God. Tell you things you didn't think that they knew about you. Now you may. I can't believe the way they talk to me that way. Well, they just gave you what you gave them. The Bible says, do unto others as you want them to do with me. So if you mean the folk, don't be mad when it comes out. What you sow, that so shall thou reap. That's right. So we have to understand that these attributes of God, the characteristics of Jesus, is not something that we're going to be good at. When you first get baptized, everybody got some funk. Everybody got some baggage. That's some funk things that we're just gonna have to grow better to end. But you shouldn't be like stagnated water and start stinking because you're not <coughs> moving. It's gonna take some time to develop these attributes, but that means we got to work hard at getting better. So let me remind you: the same gospel that saved you is the same gospel that's supposed to keep you. The same gospel that calls you to be a newborn in Christ is the same God that's supposed to make you mature in Christ. That means when you know better, you ought to do better. Amen. And he talks about uniformity and unity. I really don't want to get into that because I want to save that uh, for the next one. But the thing I guess I might as well say about unity is understand that <laughs> unity and uniformity is not the same thing. Y'all know that, right? Because on Sundays, you got people that are married in unity, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, in uniformity, they dress the same. Oh, ain't they cute? They just got the same colors on and just all oh, the shoes. Now they just come in all hoop too. But then there's no uniformity at home. There's no unity at home. We, they can look like they all got it all together when they come to church. But you don't know what kind of hell they catch at each other at home. So there's a difference between unity, which means they're one with one another, versus we dress together, we look together. So we're going to put this part on. They take putting on Christ to a whole other level. They need to put on Christ when we come in. You know what they're going to do there? Spray on the Holy Spirit when they come in and shake it off. Come on in. So be mindful that uniformity and unity are not the same thing. Well, matter of fact, what did David says? Psalms 133? How good and how pleasant 
for brethren to dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. He's telling you how good it is when we come and have a, a meeting and we come and eat. And I watch, here's the funny part, I'm going to tell you how good you know you're in fellowship. I watch the palms go from to here, to here, to here, to here, and he can do everything and everything he's going into. I said, that boy, man. And he's sitting there, you know, looking like uh, Stephen Wonder for this dog. So I'm just like, think, I said, when I grow up, if I grow up, I want to be able to say, think about all the people he knew. I want to be able to say, I knew them when I knew them, and he did this, when he was talking about some coach and help and something over here. I got to I'm just, that's when they all didn't notice, I just walked away. Because now they're talking about stuff I don't know. But that's what the fellowship was. People came from, somebody came from Huntsville, Alabama, and happened to be here. That's five hours away. You know they got fed real good, because they wallowed on the way out. Let me get that long. So all I'm saying is, in unity, we have to understand, in order for us to have unity, we got to have people, right? I mean, let's make sure, because in order to have unity, we got to have people. And going to the church house on the first day of the week is one of the best things you can do when it comes to unity. But by the same token, going to church on the first day of the week can be one of the worst things that folk can do. Somebody said, what you talking about, brother? But simple. The similar to saints, when we come to meetings, we come to fellowship, we come to fellowship, and we come to worship, should be one of the places that we know we're going to have some peace. Uh -huh. But for some people, church would be beautiful and a wonderful place to go any day of the week if it wasn't for the people. Amen. Okay, somebody missed that. Let me say it this way. The church is wonderful because of the people. But the church can be something else because of the people. Okay. That's right. That's right. We ought to be able to come to the church house yes. and say, uh, what's that song? Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Yes. I feel better. So much better since I laid yes. my burdens down. We should be wanting to sing that song. Because you should be like, you know what? I came to the church house with all that foolishness that I've been dealing with. I came and I laid it down to the Lord. Yes. Yes. But let's say they didn't. They come down and they laid it down. But then they end up walking out to my Lord have mercy. I feel worse. So much worse. Because I laid my burdens down, but somebody gave me more to take out home with me. That sometimes people don't want to come to church because they feel like they're going to catch nothing but grief, sorrow, and pain. When they ought to be getting some peace. So it's sad when folks come to church and leave worse than they ever came yes. Yes. because of the experience yes. of behavior yes. Yes. that they received. Yes. I ain't heard that from here. So what I'm saying is if you feel guilty, that means you need to change. Yes. But I'm letting you know that's been some churches that I have no desire to go back to because I didn't feel the God. Because of what was going on, yes. I didn't feel good about going back there anymore. Because I'm thinking that this is the way it's going to be, I might as well stay my tail at home. Yes. So that being said, we have to know that there's going to be some people in the church who are going to be hard to love. That, that's just it. There's some folk in the church, they're hard to love. Y'all know, there were some people back in, you just, and you get your mind ready because you're finna, let me go shake the hand. Okay, let me shake it off. Okay. You got to get your mind ready. It's like get my game face on because I'm going to have to deal with you. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27, talking about these same people, um, they tell lies from time to time. No, time to time. He said lie all the time. They get angry, cuss you out, ready to fight. Verse number 29, they don't edify, build by anybody else. So when you go talk to them, all they do is complain, and then they complain, and then they complain again. Verse number 31, they're bitter, they're angry, argumentative. And when they don't get their way, the Bible says they clap, which means they walk around slamming stuff or making a whole bunch of noise because they're not getting what they want. And then at the bottom end of verse number 31, says they'll slander your name because they don't like you. Verse number 32, they ain't kind, they're compassionate, they're not forgiven. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, uh, they hateful, they got a funky attitude all the time. He's talking about folks that are in the church. Huh? Yes. 5, 3 through 5, sexually immoral, um, unclean, greedy. They want what they want, when they want it, how they want it. If you don't like the way I got it, now I got a problem. They say what they want to say and how they want to say it. 
uh, verses 12 through 18, the stuff that they're doing in secret, they bring it into the church. What does that mean? There are going to be times that you're going to have to really work hard at loving some folks in the church. Because there's some people in the church who are hard to love because of things they constantly do. We all, every once in a while, slip up. No big deal. But there's some people that are constantly, always, and then get mad when you, you ever met somebody when they low down here for evil, love trifling, and all that good stuff, you tell them they low down here for evil trifling, and then they get mad at you because you told them they low down here for her trifling? Instead of listening, right. understanding, well, maybe there's something. Because this is not the first person that's told me that. Right, right. Changing their ways. It took a whole bunch of people to tell me, yeah, bro, you low down here. Man, bump you. And there you go, that Lord out of hatefulness. But if you hear it enough, right. that means it's time for me to make a change. Yes. yes. It's time out if you're scared to say something. Write it down and send it to him in the email. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but the same people that you tell them that they'll stop coming to church, they'll cuss you out, and they won't really change because they're telling you what they value. But the most important part about it is regardless of how mean or how bad their behavior is, guess what you still have to do? You still have to walk worthy yes. of the calling in which you were called with lowliness, humbleness, gentleness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, we have to understand that God is long-suffering with you and I. Therefore, that means you have to be long-suffering with them. And verse number 32 he says, you also have to be kind to one another, tenderhearted and forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you. That's the best way of saying this. When you know better, you ought to do better. How do you know, well this is how you know that you are my disciples. By the love that you have for one another. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yesterday was a good day. And I'm just sitting there. Y'all ever pay attention? I sit by myself and I watch. And I'm just looking at everybody talking. I'm like, who that person over there? Oh no. Somebody gets up, go talk to them. Now I missed the bulk of people. But what I did see, I was like, that's love. Then I get up and go get to eat something. And I forgot I shouldn't have eaten cabbage and eat cabbage on Sunday. Not uh, that early in the afternoon because it comes and gives you a wrong. And I, I told that sister, I said, I'm mad at her because she cooked it. So I even thought she was supposed to bake it. But if you have cabbage, if you have any problem, it'll show run through you. It tastes good. But just know that cabbage is out here. So my point is, I had to let folks know how much I enjoyed it without making a big deal about it. But I appreciate it. Because if you didn't love one another, you wouldn't have did what you did. You wouldn't have spent your own money to buy meats, whatever it is, and all the other things. And I, just for the sake of love, I ate cornbread, the skinny one. I ate cornbread, the thick one. And then I had a roll. I want to make sure I didn't offend nobody. But they all ran out of dress and I'm still upset. But anyway, the point is, I want us to continue to, to get, have the spirit of love. Because the same Christians that are here, they're Christians on uh, College Street, they're Christians on Adam Street. Guess what? We all want. Man. We got to get out of this mindset that we here in this building makes us separate. We can be separate in how we do things when it comes to our autonomy, but we still want. Don't separate them because that's their church. That's a building. Because if the Lord came down and burned this building to the ground, where are we going to do then? What are we going to do then? We still a church. Do we need a church building to be the church, to have a church? So don't get caught up. Because the point of it is love and the bond of peace. There should be unity. So LaPons hit on this morning, but if you miss Sunday school, I learned now, stop telling you that. Y'all start coming to Sunday school, you, you'll get some of the good stuff. Unity. Unity, unity. So if you know that someone's telling you your attitude is not right, don't get mad, do better. When someone's telling you that you need to change your ways, don't get mad. Do better. Because on the day of judgment, no one here will be able to have an excuse to say, I did it now. That makes sense? Uh, yeah.
We'll finish the rest of it on next week. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, I need you to know Jesus sacrificed his life for you. Yes. Him knowing that you were going to do what you did, how you were going to do it, deny him and act like he doesn't exist, he still died for you anyway. Matter of fact, he died for everybody. And according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day. Therefore, death has no more power. We can have eternal life in heaven because of what he did. But what you got to do is you have to believe that Jesus actually died for you. Yes. That he yes. did something yes. for you, yes. which means you have to value what he did. And if you do value it, that's when it's going to change your mind. Your mind gets to say, wait a minute. He did this for me. That means I believe. Remember, you're never going to believe in something you don't value. And when you believe something that you value, that means what you value is what you love. And when you love what you value and you believe, you start doing what you love, you value. Therefore, what do I need to do? The Bible simply tells you, pen of your sins. Change the way you used to think. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confess that he's the Son of God. And then go in the water grave of baptism where God will add you to the church. You come up a new creature. Remember, no one's going to be perfect on that day. Matter of fact, there are some folk that probably got baptized that day and cussed that afternoon. But you should have stood be the same way you should have been 10 years later. You're supposed to start trying to live faithful to, for the rest of your life. And if you are a child of God and you know that you have not been living right, you know it, I know it, don't get mad about it, make an effort to change. Repent of your sins and ask God to forgive you. So if anyone who needs to to invitation, they do so as we stand and sing our invitational song. Your grace and mercy brought.